everybody. I'm Jane Kamensky. I'm the faculty director of the Schlesinger Library, and I want to welcome you uh, to this panel discussion of uh, rediscovering Pauli Murray, who has never really been undiscovered, but seems to be having quite a moment now. Um, I'm going to just say a little bit about what this event means to Schlesinger, what our particular claim to Murray's legacy and her claim on our interest is, um, and then introduce my colleague, Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, um, who is going to introduce the panel, which will proceed in a true conversational format. Um, so we've all been so excited in the last couple of years as more and more new work about the life and legacy of Pauli Murray has come out uh, with uh, Dr. Patricia Bell Scott's award-winning and much-noticed book, The Firebrand and the First Lady. Last year, uh, with Rosalind Rosenberg's imminent book, uh, Jane Crow, uh, a cradle-to-grave biography of Murray, forthcoming next week, and with important chapter-length and article-length work on Murray by uh, Ken Mack in the Harvard Law School and Brittany Cooper at Rutgers and many more. Schlesinger takes particular, particular interest in all things Pauli Murray because we are the repository of her extensive collection of papers. Um, and I, I just wanted to tell you how big this collection is. Um, so the collection began to come to us in 1970, and then uh, more installments proceeded uh, by will in the wake of Pauli Murray's death in 1985. Um, and it now comprises 58 linear feet, 135 file boxes, five half file boxes, two folio boxes, 12 folio folders, and on and on. The finding aid runs to 220 pages, which is a kind of biography in and of itself and also shows the meticulous work that the library does describing things. Uh, the index to the finding aid begins with the AARP and ends with Philip Zwirling, which shows uh, some of the range of contacts that Murray had over her life and activism in many different directions. Um, we want to have a multifaceted discussion of Murray's biography and work and legacy uh, with scholars who have thought about her from many different directions. And presiding over the panel is my colleague Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, who is Victor S. Thomas, Professor of History and of African African American Studies at Harvard. Uh, she is herself a pioneer in the history of African American women, uh, not least, um, but not only with her uh, important book, Righteous Discontent, The Women's Movement in the Black Baptist Church, 1880 to 1920. I think one of the exciting things about this not only interdisciplinary but intergenerational panel is Brittany Cooper's forthcoming book engages very fully with the terms of discourse that Evelyn Higginbotham set out in that pioneering book. Um, so Evelyn, if you will Thank take you. it from here and introduce the rest of the panel. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to invite you, why don't you come on up and sit down now so that we can just immediately start. It is really a pleasure to be here today. Um, there's so much to discover and discover and to rediscover about Pauli Murray that I think the title of this symposium, symposium is quite um, appropriate. Uh, I'd like to tell you uh, what we're going to do today. We're going to have a conversation. Um, and we will, uh, each one of the uh, Panelists will answer a question, and they will talk about uh, some of the things that they found. And then around 5.30, we will open it up to you so that you can ask questions of them. Our first speaker will be um, Patricia Bell Scott. And I'll just read according to the way that they are sitting here, too. She is Professor Emerita of Women's Studies and Human Development and Family Science at the University of Georgia. She is the author, as you heard, of The Firebrand and the First Lady, Portrait of a Friendship, Pauli Mary, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the Struggle for Social Justice. And this um, book was a finalist for the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. It was also nominated for the National 
Book Award in nonfiction. Uh, it has just received all kinds of accolades. I have known Patricia Bell Scott for decades as we remembered our days in day school together. Um, <laughs> when we were among the founding uh, people in, in women's history, and, and Patricia Bell Scott is really an amazing pioneer. She is a co-founder of the National Women's Studies Association. She served for a decade as co-founding editor of SAGE. She's written a number of prize-winning books, but my all-time favorite is her co-authorship of All the Women Are White, <laughs> All the Men Are, All the Blacks Are Men, but some of us are brave. So I want to thank you, Patricia, for being brave. Because um, this is one of the first women's studies textbooks to address race, class, and sexuality. Brittany Cooper is assistant professor of women's and gender studies and Africana studies at Rutgers University. And I must tell you, she has just received tenure. And so. <laughs> We want to recognize that. <laughs> she teaches courses on black feminist theory, black intellectual thought, hip hop, gender, and the media. And her first book, Beyond Respectability, The Intellectual Thought of Race Women, will be released next month from the University of Illinois Press. She's also co-editor of the Crunk Feminist Collection, released earlier this year from the Feminist Press. And she's scholar. She's a scholar. She's also quite a public intellectual, and she's well known on radio, podcasts, and television. Rosalind Rosenberg, professor of history emerita at Barnard, is another pioneering figure in women's history. She taught at Columbia and Wesleyan universities before coming to Barnard, where she taught American women's gender and legal history until her retirement in 2011. Her books include Beyond Separate Spheres, Intellectual Roots of Modern Feminism, Divided Lives, American Women in the 20th Century, and most recently, Jane Crow, The Life of Polly Murray. And finally, Kenneth Mack is the inaugural Lawrence D. Beale Professor of Law and Affiliate Professor of History at Harvard. He is currently a Radcliffe Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. His 2012 book, Representing the Race, the, the Creation of the Civil Rights Lawyer, um, was a Washington Post Best Book of the Year, one of their best books of the year, a National Book Festival selection, and it was also a finalist for several awards. He is also the co-editor of The New Black, What Has Changed and What Has Not, with Race in America. He's also co-editor of, um, well, well, that, and that came out in 2013. So we will begin. Can everybody hear me? Well, it's quite a pleasure. Um, I, I'm already hooked up. But you are um, going to be speaking in the microphone. All right. So let me start with you, Patricia. In your illuminating book on the friendship between Polly Murray and Eleanor Roosevelt, she calls Eleanor Roosevelt ER, but you begin with the words from a letter that Polly Murray wrote to you. Now that was impressive. <laughs> In 1983, you received this letter and you state that one of the reasons you undertook the study was piqued by a reference to ER. That was found in Murray's letter to you. So tell us more about why and how you began this intellectual journey. I want to start by saying that I was introduced to Polly Murray in the early 1970s when I was a young faculty member developing a course on African American women. Can you hear me? OK. Not well? Can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm going to have to lean over. <laughs> Um, I was introduced to Polly Murray in the 1970s when I was developing a course on African American women and I, di I discovered her memoir, Proud Shoes. She had not yet entered the ministry or published her autobiography, mm -hmm. but I soon discovered that she was a person of many talents. I tracked down her poetry collection, which was out of print, some of her legal essays, as well as some of her opinion pieces. 
Her feminist writings, such as the essay, The Liberation of Black Women, spoke to me at a time when I was in the midst of three uh, career-shifting uh, projects. I was involved in the founding of the National Women's Studies Association. I was co-editing the textbook, but some of us were brave, are brave, and I was co-founding the journal SAGE. These last two projects, the textbook and the journal, caught Murray's attention, and she reacted as she often did when something stirred her. She shot off two letters. <laughs> the first letter concerned her irritation with Newsweek magazine, which had run a feature on women's studies, ignoring the contributions of black women in our textbook. Dear sisters, Polly Murray wrote to us on November 25, 1983, if Newsweek doesn't see the value of your work, here's an old timer who does, so be encouraged. It can be done. This reference to herself as an old timer makes me smile. She was only 73. And now that I have my Medicare card, <laughs> it seems young to me. Her second missive dated December 12, 1983, came after I invited her to join the board of SAGE. That missive was sprinkled with encouragement for our group, with admiration for the women activists who had taken the lessons that they had learned in the labor and civil rights movements and applied them to the women's movement. And it also had fond mention of the President's Commission on the Status of Women, for which Murray had been a subcommittee member and to which John F. Kennedy had appointed Eleanor Roosevelt as commission chair. Murray's letter also carried a line that made me feel as if she were pointing her finger in my face. She said, Dear Pat, you need to know some of the veterans of the battle whose shoulders you now stand on. <laughs> I was an all-knowing 32-year-old at the time, and that directive made me squirm. Prior commitments prevented Murray from contributing to, to SAGE because she was working furiously on her autobiography. And although I dashed off an appreciative reply, I never got the chance to ask her about the veterans whose shoulders I stood. Her death 18 months later at age 74 from pancreatic cancer caught me off guard. Having the knowledge of her illness, I had respected her wish to write undisturbed. I was distraught to learn of her death and thought that I might write something about her. But having a full plate at the time, I convinced myself that whatever I wanted to do would have to wait. But somehow or another, her lines, the words in that letter kept bothering me. And I finally decided to go back to the notion of looking at this friendship between Pauli and Eleanor Roosevelt that she intimated in her letter. And I'd made this decision for several reasons. First of all, I have always had a personal and a research interest in women's friendships and women's personal writings, particularly letters and diaries. I immediately recognized when I took a look, just a quick look at the correspondence between Pauli and Eleanor, that there was more there and that it deserved attention beyond its mentioned by previous biographers and historians. My sense of being drawn into the project was affirmed four years into the research when I came across an August 19, 1971 letter to her friend, the historian Caroline Ware, in which Mary spoke of the notes that she was making for a future biographer whose work probably would not be published in her lifetime. I felt a haunting presence as if Murray were hovering near my writing desk when I read that she had envisioned a biography that began with her battle to enroll at the University of North Carolina and the friendship with Mrs. R that I had responded to a wish Murray made long before I imagined this book, confirmed my instinct that her letter to me was more than coincidence, that she was indeed not only pointing her finger in my face, but pointing me in a direction. <laughs> Let me make a few comments about what I learned in the spirit of discovering and rediscovery. 
First of all, I discovered that the decades-long friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt, whom Murray would describe later as a maternal figure, was a place of growth and acceptance, that Murray could test her intellectual powers in this relationship, and that she never felt rejected because of her beliefs or who she was, was vital to her well-being, and dare I say, to Eleanor's growing understanding of race and the complex discrimination African-American women suffered. I discovered that the personality traits that we've come to associate with Murray as an adult were evident in, in girlhood. She was an independent spirit who preferred working alone as opposed to in groups because she was almost always ahead of the curve in her thinking. She was impatient with convention and bureaucracies, and she was often simply smarter than the people with whom she had to work. <laughs> she was willing to challenge inequality and authority figures head on no matter who they were. Indeed, she filed her first complaint against discrimination over the breakfast table when she was barely six years old. <laughs> when she asked Aunt Pauline, how come you give grandfather three pancakes and me only one? <laughs> and she never stopped asking hard questions, no matter how brash or inappropriate. I discovered that she was innately shy and that she was most comfortable and at her best expressing herself on the written page. I discovered that she was woman loving, that she refused to accept medical or cultural definitions of her gender identity and sexual orientation. I discovered that the challenges she faced having to do with gender identity and sexuality were compounded by health problems, the most persistent of these being a long-term smoking addiction, thyroid disease that was manifested in mood swings and not diagnosed until she was in her, her mid, uh, at midlife. She, was also, she also suffered intermittently from exhaustion and malnutrition. All of these factors impacted her overall sense of well-being, her temperament, her employment, work performance, and relationships. I discovered that the tragic death of Murray's seven-month pregnant mother of a cerebral hemorrhage and the racially motivated murder of her father in a mental hospital when he was an in inmate, as well as her experience as a child raised by racially proud elderly kin who were church-going school teachers, nurtured her, nurtured her compassion for the vulnerable and chronically ill, her intellectual curiosity, her love of African-American literature and history, and her devotion to the Episcopal Church. Finally, I continued to be awed by how methodically and relentlessly she worked to become an integrated person, embracing the fullness of all her interests, abilities, and identities. In fact, I particularly like a little letter that she sent to friends explaining this quest for wholeness in her life. And it was written during the early days of her ministry when she said, we bring our total selves to God, our sexuality, our joyousness, our foolishness, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how I hope that we as scholars, artists, and activists can and will examine her life in its fullness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> now, Brittany, in your remarkable book, Beyond Respectability, you analyzed black women's intellectual discourse as it was articulated over the course of the entire 20th century, actually, and with attention to the sexism inherent in Jane Crow politics, and that's Murray's term, of course, and also in respectability politics with its own gender discipline, disciplining implications. So I'd, I'd like for you to elaborate on this, this issue of respectability and the um, Jane Crow. And do that in regard to your own interesting theory, because you have an interesting theory on black gender socialization. So tell us about that. Sure. Thank you so much um, for the question. I hope you all know how um, excited I am to be sitting at this table with these luminary folks, because I know that they've made uh, it possible for me to be here and for me to do this work. Um, so thank you, and thank you. Um, and also, because we get to call Polly Murray's name, and we should do that every time we have the opportunity. So in my new book, Beyond Respectability, 
I try to situate and understand Dr. Pauli Murray within a long line of race women thinkers and public intellectuals who reshaped our ideas about gender, race, and leadership over the course of the 20th century. And one of the drums that I tried to beat in my book is to say, what does it actually look like to take black women seriously as thinkers and theorists? We say that we do this, and yet sometimes it's not clear in the work that we do. So I think it is really important to say that it matters that Murray names this concept of Jane Crow at Howard, also my alma mater, a very pro-black and pro-male intellectual space when she's a law student there in the 1940s. Jane Crow was not simply a fancy way of naming sexism. She wasn't merely being clever. It was in particular a way to articulate the politics of sexism coming out of black communities that had a deeply sophisticated analysis of the perils of Jim Crow. So in my book, I argue that, quote, in addition to being an early formulation of intersectional theory, Jane Crow also sought to name a powerful system of gender disciplining within black intellectual communities. This system, propped up by deep investments in the hetero norms of respectability politics, demanded proper sexual and gender performances from black women if they desired to be race leaders, and attempted to silence, humiliate, and isolate them when they chose not to comply. So commensurate with the cultural and gender disciplining that, that Pauli Murray experienced at Howard, it was there, I argue, that she became a race woman. So let me say more about what I mean by that. And first, I want to say that I approach Dr. Higginbotham's expansive and pioneering formulation of respectability politics uh, in this book uh, in ways, let me, let me talk more about how I approach it. Uh, and, think about it as particularly relevant because it's rooted, because Murray's articulation of Jane Crow politics is deeply tethered to black ideas about respectability. So I argue that respectability politics did not emerge after enslavement and the end of Reconstruction as simply a survival strategy or simply as a mode of public engagement. It was certainly those things. But I argue that it was also uh, or that respectability discourse also constituted one of the earliest theorizations of gender itself within newly emancipated black communities. So Anna Julia Cooper, the pioneering 19th century thinker, argued in her 1892 book, A Voice from the South, that black people were, quote, the inheritors of a manhood and womanhood impoverished and debased by two centuries and more of compression and degradation. So her argument was that Black people got gender concepts that came out of enslavement that were not particularly useful for articulating a notion of black humanity in any way that would make the argument that black people were worthy of protection. So respectability politics, though it engaged in a significant amount of gender and class policing, was really an attempt, I argue, by black communities to both articulate and produce legible categories of black manhood and black womanhood. It's not simply enough to see it as a survival strategy. It's also important to see these black people coming out of the period of enslavement and reconstruction as folk deeply invested in creating gender categories that would articulate black humanity. And so that means respecting black people as theorists of their own condition, as theorist of gender, right? And then thinking about Pauli Murray as herself a theorist of gender identity, not merely a performer or participant in an existing definitions. So by the time Pauli Murray made it to Howard Law School in the 1940s, she had reached the institutional vanguard for the performance of black respectable achievements. And I'm critiquing my institution because it's my institution. Um, <laughs> the quest for civil rights which Howard was deeply invested in, unfortunately encoded within it an expectation of respectable black behavior. So Murray's insistence on living in the tension of gender nonconformity disrupted existing black theories of gender, theories and ideas that many black communities were deeply invested in because they saw the degendering process, as Hortense Spillers talks about it, um, in slavery as one that had left them with impoverished and bankrupt conceptions of gender in the first place. So it is in that context, then, that I argue for two important understandings of Jane Crow. One is, of course, to see it as part of the early formulation of intersectionality theorizing and to think about it in the intellectual history of critical race theory, to think about it in, the, in terms of the work that Kimberly Crenshaw will come along as a legal professor and do a couple of decades later. But I also think it's important to see J Jane Crow as participating in a culture of what I call gender disciplining necessary to uphold both black respectability politics and existing black gender conceptions. 
Let me say then a bit more about Murray's time at Howard so that we can have full context. So despite the auspiciousness of Howard's intellectual and political culture, <clears throat> Murray bore the brunt of deeply ingrained sexist practices. She was the only female student in her class, and because of that, she was excluded from joining the campus legal fraternity. And when she confronted the, the dean, and I think many of us will say that she was always confronting somebody. Um, so when she confronted Dean Leon <coughs> Ransom about this obviously exclusive process, he told her to start her own legal sorority. She perceived her exclusion from the, quote, fraternity of lawyers who would make civil rights history, not as an isolated case of sexism, but rather as a representative case of a larger practice of sexist exclusion among many of the most notable civil rights pioneers. The discovery, wrote Murray, that Ransom and other men I deeply admired because of their dedication to civil rights, men who themselves suffered racial indignities, could countenance the exclusion of women from their professional association, aroused an incipient feminism in me long before I knew the meaning of the term feminism. Her experience with the intellectual and political culture at Howard involved then a kind of cultural disciplining and gender policing designed to force Murray into her place. Dealing with the kinds of racial masculinity propagated at Howard, a sort of race normative masculinity about what respectable black manhood should look like and appear to be, and the deliberate exclusion from certain privileges on account of her femaleness certainly didn't help matters. When Murray confronted the politics of racial manhood in operation at Howard, she also confronted a kind of racial disciplining that encoded a demand for strict gender conformity. Racial respectability demanded not only heteronormative gender role performances in sexual relations, but also cisgender identity performances as well. And that's one of the things that Murray helps us to see, that even before we have the language of trans and cis, which we use today, that there was still the expectation that black people, if they wanted to be respectable and have any sort of public face, would indeed be cisgender. So she's living out the politics of this, even though the language hasn't been invented to articulate the harms and the stakes of such practices. Though she was clearly committed to the uplift of her race, Murray, as many of us know, struggled to, quote, become a woman. Her own personal process of becoming coincides with her recognition and increasing acknowledgement of sexism and embrace of feminism as a response to it. Feminism then, and in particular her experience and naming of Jane Crow, helped Murray to reconcile herself with femaleness and womanhood. But she chose to acknowledge the biological fact of her femaleness and came to believe in a set of political commitments that challenged sexism. This process at Howard, this naming of Jane Crow, was part of the process by which she came to embrace her identity as a woman because naming the discrimination that she faced was part of her process of coming into a particular kind of gender identity. So then I argue finally that Jane Crow also named a socio-spatial race and gender formation in the context of black institutions like Howard that shaped black women as knowledge producers and race leaders. And whereas intersectional approaches have always sought to make black women socially and juridically legible, Jane Crow, Murray's concept and theorization, exposed the ways in which the culture of legal institutions in the civil rights era, symbolized by Howard Law School, both reified definitions of womanhood, even as it fought to make them more visible, but reified definitions in ways that could both limit and harm queer and gender nonconforming persons like Murray. Thus, Jane Crow is also deeply rooted in a black intellectual history context that sought not only to institutionalize particular definitions of racial freedom, i.e. the quest for civil rights, but also to formalize a narrative of proper race manhood and womanhood. Consequently, I argue that it was at Howard that Murray became not only a woman, but also a race woman. Thank you. Well, Rosalind, reading the first page of your amazing biography of Polly Murray, I was immediately struck, as some of you will be, when you read that Murray's many accomplishments, so you, you, you argue, um, occurred in so many arenas at the very time she struggled. And this is the interesting phrase. I quote Rosalind with what we would today call a transgender identity. Now, what led you to believe that her struggles over her gender identity were far more than a source of personal pain? Because what you're saying, it's not just that she was 
pained about this transgendered identity and are, or are confused about it, you're arguing that those very struggles over her gender identity actually shaped all of her political and social and legal insights. So talk about that. Struggling with that idea uh, made me take a very long time with this book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Murray lived in her head even more than most academics do. Uh, and late in her life, she told a friend that God had given her a male brain inside a femaleish body. Uh, and she'd felt f this way for as long as she could remember. As a child, Murray had worn boys' clothes, engaged in boys' activities, read boys' books. The neighbors laughed, but she persisted. You may have noticed in the advertisement for this panel uh, a picture of Polly Murray in a Boy Scout uniform. That picture was taken when um, Polly was 20 years old on a hitchhiking trip um, that took her through Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut, uh, where she was uh, detained by the police uh, after using a men's bathroom at the local train station. Um, she, uh, by that time, she had abandoned her birth name, Anna Pauline, and was going by the nickname Paul, although soon thereafter she chose the more gender ambiguous Polly and stuck with it for the rest of her, uh, her life. Uh, in the years that followed, Murray found support for her sense of inner maleness in the work of 20th century, early 20th century sexologists, chief among them Havelock Ellis, who argued that sex existed on a continuum. Uh, everyone is partly male and partly female. As an extreme example, Ellis offered the um, idea of the pseudo-hermaphrodite, a person with internal organs associated with one gender and external characteristics associated with another. Bingo. Murray felt that she had found her self-definition as a pseudo-hermaphrodite. Uh, Murray also found encouragement in the work of endocrinologists in the 1930s, in her 20s, who pointed uh, to sex hormones as the critical element in determining whether a fetus develops into a boy or a girl. Some scientists also reported that hormones could help effeminate boys become more masculine. And Murray reasoned that if hormones could help effeminate boys to be more manly, that they could do the same thing for her. And so for 20 years, Murray begged doctors to give her testosterone. They refused. She requested an x-ray uh, of her abdomen in order to prove that she had internal male sex organs. The x-ray the showed nothing. She underwent exploratory surgery uh, for persistent abdominal pain. The surgeon found an inflamed appendix and fallopian tube, but not the testes that Murray had hoped he would discover. Not able to persuade anyone that her true self was male, Murray suffered repeated emotional breakdowns. She spent time in psychiatric hospitals. One doctor gave her a diagnosis, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. based on his finding that she, he, she was under the delusion that she was a man. Now, these personal defeats uh, would have destroyed most people, uh, but they didn't destroy Murray. Uh, she was an extremely resilient person, but I think that her family reinforced this life-saving quality. She learned early on that she was part of a long civil rights movement that stretched all the way back to Sojourner Truth and forward to W.E.B. Du Bois, whose magazine, The Crisis, uh, appeared in the fam at the family home in Durham, in which she read uh, from uh, childhood. The pride that Murray drew from this past helped turn a crushing experience, the medical dismissal of her gender dysphoria, into part of a larger campaign for human rights. Now, the historian's secret weapon, I was told in graduate school, is chronology. Um, this is not today as popular as it was when I was in graduate school, but I've always taken it very seriously. Uh, and as I created a timeline of Murray's life, I could see that Murray's most important insights corresponded 
to periods of most intense personal struggle. Mm -hmm. As an example, and Brittany and I did not coordinate this, uh, let's take the years 1941 to 44 when she was at Howard Law School. This, she was in her early 30s. These were the years, starting at Howard, in which she developed the idea of Jane Crow, as Brittany has, has said, to convey the compounding effect of race and gender oppression. The only woman in her class, Murray could not understand why male classmates who had come to Howard to equip themselves to fight uh, against race discrimination routinely discriminated against her because she appeared to be a woman. Um, one of the most important lessons that Murray drew from her legal education was the power of analogy. In college, at Hunter College in New York, she'd learned from a class in anthropology that race was not a biological fact, but an idea. Uh, in law school, Murray came to see sex as an analogous um, condition to race. Not a biological fact, but an idea, and not a particularly good one. <laughs> For as with the concept of race, so is sex. Um, sex and race both were categories that were artificial, arbitrary, without clear boundaries. Mm. Murray, inwardly male, outwardly female-ish, was living proof of, of that. When Murray graduated from Howard, first in the class in 1944, she applied for graduate study at Harvard University. Valedictorians from Harvard, uh, Howard Law School routinely came here to Harvard um, for an advanced degree to prepare them uh, to teach uh, in law schools, to be professors in, in law schools. Uh, Harvard rejected Polly Murray because of her gender. She responded with an appeal to the law, Harvard Law School faculty, um, and at the same time that a new doctor, she kept getting new doctors, the same time that a new doctor was withholding testosterone, this is what she wrote. Gentlemen, I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements. But since the way to such change has not been revealed to me, I have no recourse but to appeal to you to change your minds on this subject. Are you to tell me that one is as difficult as the other? Apparently so. Harvard would not have her. Uh, Murray responded to this defeat by writing a series of papers over the next several months in which she laid out an argument that would guide her work over the next two decades. Her argument was that both the 13th and the 14th Amendments barred any arbitrary classification by color. By analogy, she proposed that the same reasoning held for sex. In the years that followed, Murray gave up on the idea that she had hidden male sex organs. She could not ignore the x-ray and the surgical evidence that they did not exist but she never abandoned her sense of inner maleness centered in her male brain. She deployed that feeling throughout the rest of her life to attack the laws, customs, and practices that discriminated first on the basis of race, second on the basis of gender, and finally on the basis of what she came to call status as a, quote, social minority, in quote, which was as close as she was ever to, able to bring herself uh, in her lifetime to meaning gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or disabled. Rarely has so much personal frustration been channeled into such transformative public achievement. Murray's frustration led her to pressure Thurgood Marshall to attack segregation head on, and to inspire Ruth Bader Ginsburg to argue that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment should be understand to protect not only against discrimination based on race, but also discrimination based on gender. Murray's work was a gift that has kept on giving. We are all the beneficiaries of her courage. Thank you. So Ken, from your own discussion, it's, and it's a rich discussion, I've used your, your book in my African American Lives in the Law class. In your um, discussion, uh, you, you see, and, and you, you see through this panel, there are so many different perspectives on Mary. 
And it, it does lead one to believe that her life appeals not only to all that was going on in her past, but to us today. It's so relevant, these issues that we seem to be talking about today were issues that were so germane to her. And so it, it made me wonder if it isn't unreasonable to think that it would take just a whole diversity of skills to even write about this woman. Now, do you think I'm exaggerating? Um, <clears throat> Uh, no, not <laughs> so. So to illustrate, um, I think you speak exactly right. Um, and to illustrate, let, let me just use some words. Um, how would we describe Pauli Murray? Well, we often describe people by what they do. So what did she do? She was a writer, a poet, a social activist, a civil rights lawyer, a practicing lawyer which is different than a civil rights lawyer. <laughs> she, she worked at Paul Weiss, a white shoe law firm in New York, one of the first African Americans to ever work at such a, such a law firm in the 1950s. She's a professor. She was a feminist theorist. And she was an Episcopal priest. Mm. We might also ask, uh, you know, how would we describe her in terms of our identity? Well, there's a whole bunch of other words that come to mind. Black woman, southerner. Mixed race person, black middle class person, uh, her upbringing in Durham is always key to understanding how she became who she was. A gender non-conforming person, our current word is queer. She was a black American. She went to Ghana and discovered that Kwame Nkrumah's brand of pan-Africanism was not for her. Mm -hmm. She felt like a black American mm -hmm. and human. Her final term, for all this stuff, she came up with, I shouldn't say final term, because there's, no, there's never a final for Pauli Murray, but um, <laughs> she came up with this term of human rights instead of civil rights. So these are all words that we can use to describe her. Um, but we also have to remember that these are, in fact, our words that we use in the present to describe her. Um, because, in fact, none of these terms really capture her. Um, because she was a person for whom boundaries between these kinds of things didn't really matter, or the boundaries were the problem, not the solution. So, you know, I came to conclude in my own research that it was the problem of boundaries that led to her most important personal struggles and to her most important contributions to the larger world. So, yeah, it was, it's really, really hard to describe her. Um, and that's the challenge. Now, I first encountered her, it was probably 1994. It was my first year of graduate school at Princeton. There was this book by someone named Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. It was either, <laughs> either about to come out or just come out. I can't remember. And I was in the, the basement of Firestone Library, and I was looking at all these books on black lawyers. And then there was a book uh, called Song and a Weary Throat by somebody named Pauli Murray, who I'd never heard of. Um, you could see immediately that there was something different about her, just in the book. And in the book, as, as you know, Professor Bell Scott and Professor Rosenberg, and I'm sure Professor Cooper will just you know, tell the public, you know, she hid all these things in her autobiography. Right. Um, but you could still see them. You know, she had that, she had short hair, and she was really thin, and she had this sort of way of looking at, and, and she seemed to be looking directly at you. Um, but, you know, I don't know. My agenda was elsewhere. So, you know, I knew she was interesting. I read her autobiography. But I went on um, to write about black lawyers and black women lawyers. Um, there was, I didn't have access to an archive at that time about Pauli Murray. And I wound up writing a lot about the prior generation of black women lawyers before Pauli Murray and in particular about a woman in Philadelphia, a black woman lawyer named Sadie Alexander. And I was trying to figure out an old question, which is what does it mean uh, to say that the legal profession is a masculine profession, as historian Michael Grossberg has argued in a classic essay. And I, and I was writing this book called Representing the Race, and which was really about what it meant to be a lawyer in American society and what it meant to be a racial representative. 
Um, and, you know, and I probably would never have written about Pauli Murray, um, except for this coincidence that I had this job at Harvard Law School and the Schlesinger Library was right across the street. <laughs> so, you know, you know, I was writing about black lawyers and you've got this archive that's right across the street, so you, you've got to go. Uh, that was the easy part. I mean, the hard part was what I found when I went through her papers. I found all these things that she did. And also I found all these things that she was. Um, and, you know, I was just going to make her story, you know, I, I wound up writing a chapter about her in my book, but I was just going to write 10 pages. I, I needed to kind of end the story about these black women lawyers of the previous generation and Pauli Murray seemed to be this sort of nice transition point. It seemed like it was generational. You know, 10 pages on Pauli Murray and I'd be done. <laughs> well, you know, whoever can do that. You know, soon I had 50 pages on Pauli Murray. You know, you could write a book. You could write a series of books and still not be done. So I had to kind of sort of stop at my 50 pages and condense them down and decide that I was done. Um, and, and I also decided that, you know, I wasn't, quite satisfied with what other people had said about her up until that time, which, you know, was before actually Professor Rosenberg and Professor Bell Scott's books had come out. I mean, a lot of the early writing about her really tried to reduce her to a type. I mean, she was either a Cold War conformist. Um, some people said she was a prophetic voice in the workplace discrimination movement. Some people said she was a representative of the Depression era Southern left. Some people said she was an advocate of democratic theology, an inventor of sex discrimination law, or even a precursor to the transgendered. And something seemed wrong about that way of thinking about her. So I picked kind of one particular thing to write about. You know, let's kind of, you know, what do you write about with this person who's so complicated that it's very hard to write about her? So I came up with this idea, you know, I just decided I'd try to figure out how she came up with Jane Crow. And again, the years 1941 to 44 moved large <laughs> in the story. So, you know, I had to decide, you know, you know, I decided that kind of what was most important was her struggle against boundaries. Um, and then so I wrote this chapter about Pauli Murray, and then, then, you know, a book came out, and people kept telling me that it was their favorite chapter in the book. And, <laughs> You know, it really wasn't supposed to be a chapter. It was supposed to be 10 pages. Um, you know, David Garrow reviewed in the Washington Post, and he loved the Pauli Murray chapter. You know, you know, David, he's kind of a critical guy. But he at least liked that thing. And, you know, I'd like to think that, that some of that was due to my own efforts, but I think it was due to the richness of Pauli Murray's story. And if you try to grapple with that richness, you've got a great story, no matter how you write it. So to return to this question about needing a diversity of skills to capture her life, yes, absolutely. That's the key. I think hers is a life that exists beyond all the boundaries. You know, we're academics. And to be an academic is to be a specialist. You know your set of things. But the problem is, you know, she's beyond all the sets of things that we know. So just to give two examples, her signature poem is this poem called Dark Testament. Mm -hmm. She wrote poetry, a lot of it, and it was really important to understanding who she is, was. I mean, I, I'm not a literary scholar. Um, or her deep-seated Christian faith. Mm -hmm. She was at various times a Christian socialist. She was devoted to the Episcopal Church for her entire life. She became a priest at a time where she was never sure she was even going to be ordained. You know, how does one assemble the set of skills to write about all this stuff? Well, I just got to sort of, you know, give props to Professor Bell Scott, and Professor Rosenberg, and Professor Cooper for taking this on because I think it was too intimidating a task for me to try to take on <laughs> as a book length project. So I just did a chapter about her. And I, what I decided I'd write about was law, about her legal theory of Jane Crow. And even that required me to range through topics that I didn't know a lot about, like the history of sexuality, the history of leftist activism, the history of the black middle class in Durham, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
Um, so I think I'm right about my conclusions in my chapter, and you know, I tried to sort of write a lot about law, because that was the thing I knew about. And I write up, wrote a lot about Howard Law School, because that was the thing I knew a whole lot about. Um, and I wrote a lot about her early life of the 1930s. Um, but you know, I'd say that even that was a daunting project to take on, and the others on this panel have taken on even more daunting projects and have executed them beautifully. And um, yeah, the answer to your question is yes. It's impossible <laughs> to really capture her story, and there's so much more work to be done. Thank you. I'd like to ask you, and just follow one behind the other, you know, when you think about your work with Pauli Murray, what was it that was most memorable or most striking or something that just got to you? I'd like to know what that experience was. What fascinates me most and stays with me and gives me energy and um, still puzzles me and keeps me going. I feel like I'm not done with Polly and mm -hmm. it is this particular issue that I'm still uh, feeding off of is the use of writing, particularly personal writing, as a vehicle for coming to know herself uh, as a way of dealing with uh, most issues of conflict, uh, as self-affirmation, just in general, the, the role of writing. And it's really important to me because I think in this particular moment where um, much of the tension she is getting by institutions, your alma mater will give her an honorary doctorate. It should have done this long time ago in May. Wonderful. At graduation. Wonderful. This is, you know. might have to go to graduation. Yeah, you might have to go to graduation. <laughs> Much of that is about her activism, about her legal work, and the piece I feel that's getting lost in terms of contributions is her writing. Mm -hmm. I think Proud Shoes is one of the earliest and most important examples of what we now call literary nonfiction. Mm. It is a model for contemporary memoirs. You know, when I think, look at what my colleagues in creative writing programs are trying to teach people to do. Um, her poetry is out of print, but I sort of hear that that collection may see light <coughs> again. So I am very interested in how important writing was to her, to her health, to her advocacy. And I wanted to share um, two examples. Mm -hmm. um, one example uh, is from a letter that's frequently qu quoted as of late, that it, it's written during the, here we go to that period of 1941, 44, <laughs> when she's working through a lot of issues. She has just um, come from being um, hospitalized and this is after she has um, really been ostracized and uh, treated very badly by her peers and the faculty, and it has to do with her crush on a sophomore. And she is just distraught because this, this is a relationship that is not going to work. And I'm just going to read just brief excerpts, and I think what you'll see is her working through things, but also her writing is a form of resistance. But this is one of the things she says in this letter, and it's a letter to her Aunt Pauline. This little boy girl personality, as you jokingly call it, Aunt Pauline, is sometime, sometimes gets me into trouble, and I'm no further along to adjustment than I was in the summer of 1935 when I was at home. She regularly keeps notes when she's in hospitals of what she's feeling, what she's thinking, what she's saying to doctors. And this is what she writes. I got caught between certain medical rivalries and the particular doctor threatened to have me sent to Gallagher Hospital for mental observations. And I, of course, might have been put out of commission for a long time on the basis of family history alone if that had been carried out. She doesn't write about her family history <coughs> of mental health problems. There's a history in the family, and that's not in the autobiography. Uh, and then she also says, I have done nothing of which to be ashamed of. 
outside the rules of society. And yet, if it had not been for people like Dr. Ransom, these are her mentors, my whole career for two years at Howard would have gone up in smoke. Mother, you've been so understanding, both you and Aunt Sally, but where you and a few people understand, the world does not understand or accept my pattern of life. And to try to live by society's standards always causes me such inner conflict that at times it's almost unbearable. I don't know whether I'm right or whether society or some medical authority is right. I only know how I feel and what makes me happy. This conflict rises up to kick me down at every apex I reach in my career, and because the laws of society do not protect me, I am exposed to any person or enemy who may or may not want to hurt me. So she, very clear or clarifying ideas of where the boundaries are, who's for her, who's against her, what's fair, what's not, but clear about what she needs and where she would like to go. And Another example I'd like to share comes from a period when she's really upset about uh, not being able to go to the University of North Carolina. They rejected her on racial grounds in 1939, and she was buoyed. She really thought that she might be able to uh, be admitted because, the, because of a recent court ruling. And it involved a young man, Lloyd Gaines, who the court said needed to be, deserved to be admitted to the University of, North, uh, University of Missouri Law School. But before he could enroll, he disappeared and he was never found again. He was believed to be murdered or, um, and so Polly was just outraged. And I share this because this, uh, this is one sentence which shows you the kind of energy that comes to her in moments like this. And this is what she's writing because there's been um, a, a prize fight in, in the black community. People were really excited about this. And the title of this hot article is, is called, Who is to Blame for the Disappearance of Lloyd Gaines? And this is the final paragraph. She writes, we Negroes can throng the streets 300,000 strong, break bottles over resisting heads, stop traffic, commandeer buses and other public vehicles and show unprecedented aggressiveness, joy, and hilarity when a Joe Lewis knocks out a single white opponent by appointment, but when a Lloyd Gaines single-handedly comes up against a whole region of the country with his hidebound folkways of white supremacy, with his lynching parties, and with the great majority of his population disenfranchised and disinherited, when he battles his way to the Supreme Court and back again, Facing the insults, the butts of criticism, the uncertainties, the threats, the inner great struggle between idealism and personal safety, when he does all this alone with scarcely more than his own conscience and a few loyal friends to reassure him, not a single mass discrimination demonstration is held anywhere in the country. In spite of this biting call, she concludes this by saying, fine, Lord Gaines, if he cannot if he can be found. If not, finish the job he left uncompleted. One sentence is all that. <laughs> That's how much she cared. Mm -hmm. um, so I, a, a couple of things really strike me um, and that stick with me about Polly Murray. Um, because I care a lot about black women's intellectual history, I'm just struck by the breadth of how many intellectual intervention she's at the forefront of, whether we're talking about feminist theory, critical race theory. Um, you know, her, her thesis in divinity school was a comparison between black liberation theology and feminist theology. So that's the precursor to what we come to know as womanist theology, right? You actually can't start it if you don't look at her thesis, right? Um, and so she really invents and helps to create the context for, mo for many of the major intellectual interventions that come out of black studies and feminist thought in the 20th and 21st century. Um, and I hope that she will continue to get credit for that. Um, on a more narrow note, in 1969, um, Dr. Murray is a professor of American studies at Brandeis. And it's happening at the same time 
that the black study that black students take over the campus they are demanding the start the the founding of black studies and so she's brought in uh she works on the administration there and you know they want her to you know kind of help keep these black students in line i mean it's you know in line with institutional practices today black students act up and then folks say who can we bring to help them feel better <laughs> but murray um was conflicted because she really did not, she was very ambivalent about this new turn to blackness. By this point in her life, she had really embraced a multiracial perspective of herself. She pref preferred to be called Negro with a capital N. Uh, and she, you know, said that the, that quote, the rhetoric of black power, quote, graded upon her sensibilities because she felt that she was, quote, living in a world turned upside down with a complete reversal of the goals that had fired her own student activism. So she saw the black power movement, whom she derisively called the apostles of black consciousness, uh, as in deeply masculinist and patriarchal, which is a fair critique. Uh, but because of that, it made her particularly resistant to the kind of all-consuming power of blackness. Uh, and at that same moment, she loves these students and she's deeply committed to them. Patricia Ho Collins is one of her students hmm. who she talks about briefly in a line in her autobiography. And she says, you know, I had this wonderful senior student who walks out of the class yelling black solidarity one day, black power. And it was Patricia Hill Collins, you know, and I emailed Dr. Collins. I said, was this you? And she said, yes, you know, this is my, you know, this is my professor, right? And so, you know, it, there's also these sort of different genealogies of black feminist thought. But the thing that I wonder in this moment of the movement for black lives is how Dr. Murray might think about it. Mm -hmm. Because I think she would be deeply resistant to the continuing sort of the, the, the embrace of the primacy of blackness and this analysis of anti-blackness. I think it would make her very uncomfortable. But I think the challenge for her would be that it is the movement for black lives that has been at the forefront of saying that we will center and we will prioritize black gender nonconforming and trans people, that their lives matter, that they have to be a political priority. Uh, and so I think her resistance to, resistance to the, the, the analytic of blackness was because she saw it as, as bespeaking particular analogical limitations on gender. Right, so the moves that she couldn't make around gender and sexuality in her lifetime, her history allowed her to make those moves in terms of race. So she couldn't be a sexual person the way that she wanted, but she could be multiracial because it was her background. And so I think that she saw blackness as really limiting and putting her in another box. And yet in this moment, the sort of fervor around young people of color's ability to be gender nonconforming unapologetically and to say that that is a part of black politics has happened on the, on the backs of a sort of new black power movement. So I think it would create real conflict for her. And I'm just reminded then of a question that she asked. I found in the archive when I was here, you know, she wrote this piece in 1942 called Negro Youth's Dilemma. And it was about all of the angst and anger of her generation around World War II. But in 1969, she pulled out a copy of Negro Youth's Dilemma and she just scribbled on the bottom of it, postscript 1969. Another war, another generation of angry youth. How do slash shall we answer them? Mm -hmm. um, I never experienced an epiphany. Um, it was more a slow dawning. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt paved the way by giving me my first big break as a writer. I interviewed her in 1960 when I was 14 years old. Oh she was spending the winter at the Arizona Inn. We talked about the Soviet Union, the value of learning Russian, and the importance of getting to know people different from ourselves. I published the story in my Tucson High School newspaper. It was my very first story. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg continued my education when I reached Columbia as an assistant professor in 1974, Columbia Law School's first tenured female professor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, made me aware of Polly Murray, um, whose name she had included with uh, her own on her first brief in a case called Reed v. Reed, uh, which, which the Supreme Court uh, recognized gender uh, as an arbitrary classification. Um, but at the time, I didn't really understand how pivotal Murray was. Um, 
Not until I read Murray's autobiography, Song in a Weary Throat, in 1987, that I finally appreciate Murray's pioneering role in civil rights, modern feminism, and in the shaping of modern jurisprudence. As I included her as a transitional figure uh, in my History of Women in the 20th Century, which I called Divided Lives, Polly Murray linked Eleanor Roosevelt and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, but it was only in the mid-1990s, after the Schlesinger Library uh, made Murray's papers available to researchers, that Murray's importance finally dawned on me. Um, I was struck especially by her long-term struggle over gender identity, as I've said, uh, and its connection to her campaign against what she called Jane Crow. Uh, as many researchers have uh, found, box four was particularly mm -hmm. striking. Uh, reading Polly Murray's notes to her herself, and as a parenthetical, one reason I became a 20th century historian was because I had so much difficulty with people's handwriting. In the 20th century, people start using the typewriter. Holly Murray had the typewriter with her in the hospitals. <laughs> she either voluntarily entered or was con consigned to. These notes are typewritten. Um, not the letter to, to Aunt Pauline, but the, the letters from the hospitals. Um, and they were incredibly powerful. Um, they, the, the clarity of her conviction that she uh, was inwardly male, a pseudo-hermaphrodite, as she said, uh, how hard she fought with doctors to help her change her outward appearance to align with her inner self, how poignant to read about that at a time when there was no social movement to mm -hmm. support her. Um, was that, that, that was very, very moving to me. Uh, these notes end in the 1950s. Um, by then, she'd given up on the idea that she was a pseudo-hermaphrodite. But later letters and diary entries make clear that she never abandoned her belief in her inner maleness. Especially in her years as a priest, she came to think of God um, as having made her a person in between, male on the inside, female on the outside, to serve as a bridge, to help others overcome the socially imposed divisions of male and female, black and white, north and south, rich and poor. That goal of hers of reconciliation that she pursued in the priesthood was what I found most moving and what made me want to tell her story. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, um, you know, what really struck me about um, researching Polly Murray was, um, I, I think, basically everything. Um, and and I, by that I mean this, you know, every time you go to research something, the story winds up being a lot more complicated than you imagine it to be. So I'll just give you a couple examples. Um, yeah, I decided that I needed to learn a little bit about uh, Durham's black community and you know, her growing up and what did that mean, and I read a whole lot about it. And then, uh, and then I read Proud Shoes. And I was just going to kind of skim Proud Shoes, but you start reading it, and you actually wind up having to read it, because I agree, it's just so well written. It's a great book. Great. Um, and the story she tells is just fascinating. It turns out, you know, I was thinking, okay, she's from the a black middle class community in Durham. E. Franklin Frazier wrote this you know, wonderful essay, Durham, mm -hmm. the capital of the black middle class. Mm -hmm. Lots of other people have written about Durham. Turns out that her family, they're both in and they're not in. That's the kind of key to that part of Proud Shoes. They don't live in West Durham, which is where most of the black people live. They kind of live out of town. There's this little marsh in the story that's a metaphor. It's between her house and the rest of the black community. And she talks about sort of, you know, encountering all these other people who are on the other side of the marsh and how that's so difficult and complicated. Right, so, you know, you start to kind of think, all right, well, you know, you have to learn about the black middle class in Durham to kind of understand her and that's sort of where she comes from. But it turns out that she's kind of on the other side of this boundary, uh, which she writes about in Proud Shoes. And the boundary is really complicated. And what does it mean? Uh, it means a bunch of different things. Uh, but that's like every story. 
about Murray. Um, you know, the, the Howard Law School story, which we've all written about, and I read it in her autobiography, and I, I thought I knew what was going on, but the more I delved into it, the harder it was to understand what was going on. Leon Ransom is her mentor. Um, he's the Howard Law professor who encourages her to apply to, to, uh, to law school, and, you know, and she credits him with saving her. But he's also one of these sexist professors um, that you know, kind of convinces her that like, you know, something's really wrong, and she's got to kind of put a better name to it. So everything about Howard is ambiguous. She loves being there. She loves being part of that group of African-American male civil rights lawyers. Um, but she's also kind of not part of it as well. And I think the relationship with Ransom is a kind of metaphor for the whole thing. Um, Ransom is both a sexist and the person who, when she has this kind of failed relation, failed affection for this uh, Howard undergraduate, she credits him as the person who really stood up for her when nobody else would. Um, uh, so, you know, every story about Murray is like that. Um, you think you sort of know the story, and you think you know the boundaries, but then she's, the boundaries aren't clear, and she's kind of outside of them. And, you know, the, the last example I'll give is, you know, this how to think about Murray in the present, and I've kind of sort of gone on record about this, about my kind of skepticism about kind of making a presentist analogy to Murray. But, you know, I don't know. In 2013, President Obama gives a second inaugural address, and, you know, and he's talking about the Declaration of Independence, the Civil Rights Movement, all of a sudden he's talking about gays and lesbians, and everyone's saying, oh, what a wonderful thing it is. And, you know, then so I write an op-ed about Pauli Murray and about, you know, how she's this kind of, um, you know, little-known progenitor of this move that, that Obama finally did. Um, and it's kind of, you know, found myself doing kind of what everybody does. You know, you're kind of mobilizing Murray to, you know, <laughs> deal with the present. And, um, and, you know, is that right? Is that not right? I think it is right because I think, you know, my own thesis about Murray was that it was the boundaries, right? That I, she, she didn't like being classified as a particular thing, as being part of a particular group. She, she did and she didn't. She was very proud of being a Negro. She was very proud of all, lots of things to the end of her life. Um, but I think, you know, am I right to sort of say that, you know, that, you know, when we think about, you know, things like, um, you know, bathroom bills and things like that, that, that do I know which side Murray would be on? Yeah, I think I am right, because she was really about these boundaries. You know, I don't know which way she would classify herself. You know, her story's always more complicated than we make it to, out to be, but the one thing that was constant was this, this questioning of boundaries and always seeing them as complicated things, both helpful to her and, and harmful to her at the same time. Um, and I think that was the most surprising thing and the most unsettling thing um, that I found when I was researching Murray's story. Thank you. Thank you.